So the thing to do, the thing is the um, there's so much endless. You know, the amount of talking about the amount of talking about European immigration on on um on YouTube and the internet generally, we've got to this sort of intense hysterical peak because um. Really, one of the biggest problems is nobody really knows what's going on. A lot of people can see that. A lot of people see that all these orchestrated campaigns with um, people smugglers, uh, hand in hand with these NGOs, fraudulently um, channeling. Uh, all these uh, immigrants to um, these African and Arab immigrants to Europe. A lot of people can see that, that there's something's going on, and a lot of people are angry and confused. And you you can read a lot of things. You know, the Illuminati wants to destroy Western society. They want to bring in black people to get rid of white people. Um, yeah, it's a war on Christianity. It's a secret Muslim war on on the West. Um, and there's this current hysteria against immigration, which was basically led by you always spell I mean it's been taken advantage of by right-wing politicians, certainly by Donald Trump, talking about increased immigration from into the U.S. and um, you know, talking about all this hijinks in Europe about floods of immigrants um, raping and you know bludging on welfare and doing nothing but rape white people and. Uh, I think it is. There is a reason for it, and yes, there's a plan behind it. And really, it's the same old plan. I think a lot of the people who hysterically go on about you know, the, um, the Illuminati plan, the Jewish plan to destroy the white race. Uh, Um, I think, practically speaking, I mean that may <laughs> that may be in the minds of some people, but practically speaking, there's much more mundane reasons for the new ways of immigration into the Western world, and and that's globalization, because <clears throat> um. Well, the one I think it's worth observing that in the past 20, 30 years, since, I mean, even since the Second World War, when, uh, yeah, when Japan and Korea were exploited as sources of cheap labor to make cheap, what was then cheap copies of Western goods, which um, over the decades, Japanese quality controls increased more and more to the point where Japanese goods, when they used to make things in Japan, you know, there was a, about a decade when they used to make things in Japan and they actually were of good quality. Um, but then there was this crash where they moved all these Japanese companies, moved a lot of their manufacturing to China and Vietnam and whatever, Philippines. So, um, but that's just an example of globalization where there's basically, that's the, the puzzling thing about the current waves of immigration into the West is people can't work out why because there's 
there just aren't any jobs in the Western world anymore. Um, I mean, all the manufacturing jobs in Europe, America, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, they, they've all gone to China. They, they, you, you can't get anything that isn't made in China anymore. Um, or whatever. Vietnam or the Philippines or, or just or Eastern Europe, Hungary. So uh, the thing is, part of the globalization plan was to move manufacturing, well manufacturing, to third world countries where they can pay the workers a tenth of what they pay in, in America. And they've even gone to, they've moved all the, um, the once high paying lucrative IT programming jobs, they've moved them all to India. So it's obvious to see that in the name of profitability, it's outsourcing to the, we the the third world, China, India, whatever, Mexico, outsourcing to the third world is very profitable. Now, this idea has got such a momentum, it's, it's become what's known as globalization, where, where you have, <laughs> you have many these sort of mini imitations of Western society in India and Asia, like you have you have yeah technological cities with commuters and people commuting from their suburbs to their jobs in town, and that's globalization. We have these mini clones of America. And Europe, these clones all over the world. Um, and these clone societies exist cheek by jowl with old traditional agricultural societies, which um which have like have been shunted into complete economic irrelevance. Uh, I mean like in India or anywhere. Um, so you've got you've got these wealthy you know um, yeah you got yeah, anyway anyway the point is the whole driver of this system is the the difference between the level of the U.S. dollar and and other currencies um, while there's money in America. And Europe, they'll go on making cameras and mobile phones and even cars and consumer goods and kitchen machines and whatever. They'll make them in whatever country has low wages and has um, yeah, a sufficiently large population with a skill set to, to do the job. Uh, Now, what's really important to understand is that until now, there's the core industry in the Western world that has resisted globalization is, well, there's, yeah, there's government, there's education and sort of government jobs, and there's the construction industry. See, of all the industries, the, the, the industries that do, that do survive in the Western world are the ones that you just can't easily export to the third world. And that's a good example, a prime example, is the construction industry. Um, it's, not, it's not really economic to, you can't fly in workers every day from one side of the world to the next. They would if they could. But it's not economic to fly in workers from 
the third world, it's not economic to have um, construction materials, prefab stuff. It's not really it's not really economic for them to have prefab stuff made overseas. It's a lot more economic for them. They just have to have it done locally. Um, so things like yeah, modular house frames and sheet metal ductwork and all these things need to be, unfortunately, need to be still. Um, they're still till now made in made in the Western world, at least, like in Australia. They're, they're still made in Australia because it's not economic to export the industry. Now, added to that, the construction industry historically has been subject to lockdown control by militant unions. Um, the construction trades, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, gas spinners, bricklayers. Um, their unions have been typically vigilant, very vigilant, and like a lot, a lot of industries, there's great barriers for anyone who wants to even get a foot in the door um, to a construction, a lucrative construction job like say an electrician because anything like that there's a thousand qualifications and certifications you have to have in you know, safety etc. that make it virtually impossible for outsiders to get into the industry and and even the lower end jobs in the construction industry, like the hard, dirty, dangerous jobs, like laboring, even they, even they have been um, subject to regulation. And they, they typically even, uh, even laboring on a construction site or being a trades assistant, I mean, doing the work of a, of a of a tradesman. Um, until now it's been quite lucrative but things are changing because the the industry has done everything it can to completely bypass unions and to bypass the unions and to um, casualize the whole industry and make almost everyone working on contracts instead of working under industrial relations legislation as permanent employees and they've basically fired all the permanent employees and put everyone on temporary contracts. Um, so there's all these things that the industry has done to try to completely balkanize and divide and conquer the whole industry. and and cut down their costs. Well, it doesn't really cut down their costs, their costs of sort. But that was going to happen anyway. These people aren't the sharpest tools in the shed. But anyway, uh, uh, and that's one thing worth thinking about in terms of the whole immigration debate is that the one stubborn holdout industry in the Western world, which actually employs like thirty percent, you look into it, it's all this a lot construction industry and allied businesses, they employ quite a huge proportion of people in the Western world. Now, this is a stubborn holdout industry where you, I mean, you can go to a construction site and you will see tradesmen, well-paid. Tradesmen doing their jobs, and there will be engineers and architects in the office, sitting sitting at computers and shuffling paper and getting getting pulling a salary. And it's like it's like the 1950s in a way. There's this, this sort of um, yeah. There's this um, <clears throat> time warp where 
for you know until now people have had just good jobs but now but now this is this industry this, this stubborn holdout is is under assault by the Illuminati whatever you want to call them the globalists because they don't want to pay workers money they don't want to pay a worker 20 bucks an hour equivalent or more and more they don't want to pay workers 20 20 30 bucks an hour to to um you know carry building materials or or whatever they do um uh So, one way, is, well in Europe, the European construction industry has benefited from a huge influx of Eastern Europeans into Western Europe. And so, and there's many, many Russians and Slavs and Poles, well, the Poles are Slavs, there's all these Slavs working all around Europe. In construction, doing yeah, doing uh, the lower end jobs that nobody else wants. Um, but I don't think that's enough. Um, the the powers that be just don't want to give people money. They have plans. Construction makes. I mean building and development makes a great deal of money I mean you can you know you can build a house for a hundred thousand and sell it for a million if you're in the right spot the the people power that be just don't want to pay the workers any money and if you think about it, the only way to um, to drive down the cost of labor in the construction industry in America or Europe or anywhere is to bring in more and more hordes of willing workers and they don't have to be educated and they don't have to be literate and they don't have to they, they, they don't have I mean they don't even have to speak the, the, the local language they just have to do what they're told and, and carry the bricks and whatever the, the. so and that's what you see frankly in America the people who do all the um, lower end hard dirty dangerous work in construction in the United States are Mexicans or Central Americans There's, I mean, it's almost exclusive. You won't. Um, people who do. I mean, people who do drywall. Um, uh, drywall contractors, um, stucco. All these sort of. Um, all the painting and decorating and. dusty hard jobs like that they're they're all Mexicans and um, um yeah uh, but I mean in Europe I think the Europeans are they don't want to pay French or German um, tradesmen whatever uh, a decent wage they just want to um they want to bring in just thousands of millions of foreigners to just dilute dilute the labor market and drive down wages and um, and well immigration just generally means more building and more construction work so they think they'll make there'll be more demand for new construction um, but yeah that's um that's something worth considering